Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I am a professor of about 25 years, a former competitive bodybuilder, uh, and currently a, a food and academic industry consultant. This is Coach Jarrell. I'm a gym owner, a strength guild uh, lifting coach here in Kansas City. Um, here to bring you some good stuff this morning. Cool. All right. It's just going to be Jarrell and myself, everyone. Uh, Phil is out sick. Uh, Mike is traveling. He's often traveling, but this time he's traveling and can't uh, <laughs> bust out his mic and get online. So uh, we have a piece of news today, uh, kind of nutrition related. And then after the break, we're going to talk about uh, lifting technique versus style. And I'm going to leave uh, that mostly to Jarrell because he's the expert on that. Definitely not me. Um, OK, so a new paper came out and it, it's sort of eye rolling, to be frank. It's another pile on against red meat. Uh, and we're going to go somewhere with this, actually, when we discuss it. But let me just share this study. Brand spanking new. End of October of this year, red meat consumption associated with increased type 2 diabetes risk. And uh, before we hit record, everybody, uh, Drell was saying, and I agree, like, oh, man, I thought protein was supposed to be bad for your kidneys and for your you know, blood lipids. And, well, it, yeah, it's diabetes as well. But we're going to dive into this just a little bit. So it says the researchers found that consumption of red meat, including processed and unprocessed red meat, so side note, I'm glad they're at least trying to tease that apart, was strongly associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, we know a lot of lifters enjoy their red meat in copious amounts. Anyway, participants who ate the most red meat had a 62% higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared with those who ate the least. Every additional daily serving of processed red meat was associated with a 46% greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes, uh, and every additional daily serving of unprocessed red meat was associated with a 24% greater risk. So like half the risk with the unprocessed, but still 24% higher. By the way, I'm getting this from Science Daily. Uh, The source is the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. That's a legitimate source. I went and looked at the actual paper, And this looks like it's based on the nurse's health study. So this would be the usual caveat that I'll hear from, you know, you like uh, Phil or you, Jarrell, and these guys aren't lifters. They're not physically active. And obviously that's going to hugely cut your risk of diabetes because you're actually using your muscles. But this is from Gu, G-U and colleagues, Zhao Gu. Uh, Red meat intake and risk of type 2 diabetes in a prospective cohort study of United States females and males. Now, just drop it in the bottom here. It says results. We documented 22,761 type 2 diabetes cases. Intakes of total processed and unprocessed red meat were positively and approximately linearly associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Comparing highest to lowest quintiles, so people in the top 20%, right, versus the bottom, hazard ratio were 1.62 for total red meat, so that's when they lump it all together, which I don't like when they do that, 1.51 for processed red meat and 1.4 uh, for unprocessed red meat. So, yeah, even getting at the unprocessed thing, I've seen some stuff lately about how this might be through like a gut bacteria mechanism. Uh, they did semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaires. So... Not to bore everybody with methodology, but it does kind of matter. So I'm going to just read a little bit here from uh, – this is Karen Michaels and Walter Willett, self-administered semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaires. They're not perfect, right? It's not like a full-on diet record where you're measuring everything and it's really tightly quantified. So it says for Nurses Health Study 2, we administered the semi-quantitative FFQ – developed by Willett et al., so one of the authors, for each food, a commonly used unit or portion size, like one egg, one slice of bread. So they're not actually measuring it. They're just kind of saying, here's a unit of food. From memory, how often do you eat this? You know, one to two times a week, two to three, three to four, that kind of thing. So it says, 
There are nine possible responses ranging from never to six or more times a day. The intake of nutrients is then computed by multiplying the frequency that the person reports by the unit of food, right? Whatever they're kind of pitching as a serving. So it's only semi-quantitative. It does beg the question. Sometimes I've seen like if somebody doesn't remember, I don't remember if I had any milk this week. If they leave it blank, typically that could be counted as a zero, but you know, it's not perfect. And they have to do it this way, right? They're not going to be measuring with a kitchen scale every single person, uh, thousands and thousands of participants. So I guess my question for you, Drell, would be that, first of all, what are you, what are your thoughts on red meat in your own you know, muscle development? And do you think it's screwed with your metabolism at all? Because this is just a pile on in the media, I feel like, uh, relentlessly against red meat. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about necessarily red meat. Part of it's because I spent most of my muscle building years poor, so it wasn't like I was just pounding a ton of red meat. But I did eat like a lot of eggs, which kind of get lumped into the same category because eggs are cheap. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so, and with anyone I've ever coached, I just, you know, I've never seen that significant of a like difference as long as you're hitting the numbers, like hitting the macros, hitting your calories and and whatnot. Mm-hmm. The one thing I will say is like red meat is like for for me, at least taste wise, it's just better on it like essentially on its own. Like I have to do less stuff to it. So it's easier for me to eat higher quality stuff with lower like lower fats. Like I you know, I'll generally stick to like leaner stuff for the most part. Yeah. Like at least a two to one or a three to one protein to fat ratio, something like that. Mm-hmm. So, but a, a lot of these studies, I think, kind of just miss the context of someone's diet, like just a blanket, oh, you know, red meat versus someone who's not eating red meat is already like a definition of or a declaration of conscious eating. So people who are not consciously eating or whatever that's usually the the major issue and then you know the vegans every what every three years there'll be a new documentary that's like eggs are like smoking or something like that yeah but it's like the context of the studies is like someone who's a vegan is like making a conscious choice towards you know their food intake whereas a lot of people who are red meat eaters it's not like they're consciously choosing their diet necessarily So that's always like, if you're a conscious eater, and I'm using that in terms of like, you understand kind of, you have at least a realm of understanding of like what you're taking in, why you're taking it in, and you have some, you know, goal, at least, you know, vague, cloudy or not towards health or physique or whatever, right? So if you have that and you eat consciously towards that, like if you go up, group those people in and then separated them with, you know, red meat versus non red meat, whatever, those numbers would like kind of level out. Like it just wouldn't be that extreme. Like maybe, mm-hmm. you know, some red meat would have maybe a little more of X, Y, and Z, but also I feel better when I eat more red meat than I just stick on like chicken or, you know, whatever. Like, yeah, I, oh, yeah. I do think there's some, and that is completely, you know, I heard what is it, Stan Efferding say this one time, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll, and I just include as much as I can. And I do feel better when I include more red meat, but I'm making conscious choices towards red meat. Like, I'm, like, I'll do like the Piedmontese steaks, which are like really low fat, you know, cows essentially. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll, so I'll make conscious decisions to include more red meat, and I do feel better when I, included so i always think it's like an advantage to like include more red meat than less if you're a conscious eater yeah there's a lot of zoo chemicals in red meat i mean meat in general is just such a i mean look at the food chain kind of thing you know the the grazing animals do all the work you know eating the low quality grasses then we just eat them (laughs) and they've got all these great nutrients in there and even non-essential stuff like creatine and you know carnosine and all this stuff To your point about conscious eating, literally, it says in this news clip from Science Daily, it says researchers also found replacing red meat 
with healthy plant-based protein sources, again, I'm just revisiting this, such as nuts and legumes or modest amounts of dairy foods was associated with a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. And that goes back to what you were just saying. Like That's a conscious choice. How many people who are really heavy red meat eaters can do a drive through and pick up nuts and legumes instead of a Big Mac? <laughs> they can't do it. They'd have to consciously, purposely go grocery shopping for this stuff, right? So the barrier to entry like this, so you could say, oh, you, from a health perspective, it's better to eat some of these things, to mix in some nuts and seeds, legumes as a protein source. And yet, how are people supposed to do that? Like you said, they're not even thinking about it. They're just running around and it's not a very conscious choice unless, again, we're trying to apply this to, you know, weightlifters and bodybuilders and whatnot. They do make conscious choices. Their diet pattern is way different. In fact, the dietary guidelines for Americans over the last, oh, at least I think half a decade, has tried to focus on dietary patterns, right? Because the way you or I would eat red meat is not just a Big Mac three times a day. It's going to be, like for me, it would be round steak, you know, with a huge side of asparagus and maybe a baked potato or something. It's not the same thing. And also, yeah, when it comes to some of the methodology and the, you know, I think researchers, when they, not so much researchers, the science writers, when they report this stuff, they need to say, well, this is based on a food frequency questionnaire and self-report and people trying to remember what they ate. And, you know, there are limitations. I'm sure the researchers probably talked about it, but that doesn't usually trickle into the news. You know, the news is going to get a hold of this and say, red meat causes type 2 diabetes. Eat plants. Yay, plants. But especially as I get older and become a little bit more like anabolic resistant. Uh, already I need more protein to get the same, you know, muscle protein synthesis response and then stack on top of that. Now, if I'm going to try to do that with plants, that's going to be hard because they're less digestible. I have to eat more. I have to eat more different varieties of them and you can do it. I mean, I'm sure you can do it, but like you, I've just always felt better. Uh, consuming red meat. I'll get sometimes like 90% lean burger, a lot like what you say. I'll get like the 90% lean is like the two to one protein to fat ratio. So you get like 20-ish grams of protein for maybe nine or 10 fat, whatever. Or like I said, or, you know, round steaks and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know. It just feels like a pile on. And that brings on the second question I have for you is when you look at science or you hear science news, do you think it's influenced? Uh, because for listeners, before we hit record, the record button this morning, I was just mentioning how I feel like the media differs based on political pressures, right? You have what people would call the liberal media or the conservative media. And I think some of this stuff, like Gen Zers are more interested in the environment. And I think at least lay consumers really doubling down on plant-based everything. If it's plant-based, they're going to buy it just because it has sort of this eco vibe to it. But I just ran down some of the problems with plant-based proteins being less digestible. You know, they're missing occasional indispensable amino acids. So they're just l less anabolic and any single one of them might be. So do you take that into account that maybe even in science it's affected by trends or do you think, no, it's science, it's peer reviewed I just straight believe it. How do you how do you address that? I mean, so I, I don't read as many science papers as I used to, but I do think it's certainly affected, particularly with trying to get headline, like the effort to get a headline. And I know there's pressure just because you know when I was in the actual science department at Washburn, it's just like you understand that there are pressures for you know funding, even if it's like kind of indirect. Like you, you're like, all right, we have to get something that hits, like something that, you know, triggers something. That's the goal. Now mm -hmm. I did, like, I'm not suggesting that any, like in none of the teachers or professors that I uh, worked with in college were, I would just say directly swayed by that. Like they, they weren't, but they would acknowledge that that was like an existing thing in the field because like, and just being aware of it, like understanding like this is kind of the, we'll call it the game of sorts. Mm -hmm. It maybe subconsciously to some degree affects it. Cause my thing with science, and this is what I always tell people is like, and no scientists you talk to, like 
everyone hates scientists because they are so careful and most of the truth is more boring than you expect it to be. It's true. <laughs> and then scientists are like, so the people who say an absolute, like, an, you know, an absolute statement, like this is the greatest thing or whatever, you can pretty much eliminate them from the science category for the most part. Because every scientist that I know, there could be a 0.03 chance that they're wrong. And they still acknowledge that 0.03. Like, they'll still be like, well, I mean, for the most part, like that. Like, that's like the language they use. I had, I've never been around scientists that aren't like, and then there's like kind of a new wave of what I would just consider pop science, like where it's the, like the popular famous, like podcaster type scientists who they'll make big claims and use, you know, scientific papers and scientific literature in a kind of misleading way. Mm -hmm. And then they'll speak it in like this absolute and there, there's like no humility in it. I'll say that like with little humility. So this is how I kind of look at the science world. This is the easiest way for me to like, I, that's how I determine if I, if I just meet someone right out the street and they say that they're all, uh, you know, scientists about X, Y, and Z, PhD. If they're about to tell me something and they, they give it some sensationalized sales pitch, because even even last week when we were talking about creatine, which is like the one of the like most researched, like the crazy, you know, all right. the crazy benefits and all that stuff. Creatine has a lot of that, but it's boring and cheap. So, mm -hmm. you know, no one wants to like go too hard at selling it. And you guys are all in the field of, you know, or he was in or Dr. Mike, you guys have done a ton of research on caffeine, creatine. Do you guys don't speak? be glowingly about creatine to the point where it's like, oh my gosh, I need to go buy some right now. Yeah. That's like in, in being analytical and logical, which is who normally ends up in the science fields, right? It just lends you this kind of like sometimes maybe an imposter syndrome aspect. Uh, not necessarily like imposter syndrome directly, but just in that, like if there's a chance that this won't, work like any percentage of chance you acknowledge that percentage of chance whereas like a headline does not a headline will mm -hmm. speak glowingly of x y and z and then those headlines are what get clicks and views and so in this particular climate that's usually what you know most people are after it's like there's no good or bad clicks anymore just clicks so it's like you got to get attention sell your ideas and Finding the truth is kind of a vague, you know, almost like tertiary point for most, like, I don't want to say institutions, but like most of the field and most of the public perception is not anywhere near interested in like the true solution because it just yeah. isn't going to sound as sexy as it, as it really, like they want to hear it. You know, it's a good point. For ages, we used to teach like research ethics, like look and see if the study was sponsored by someone. It doesn't mean that it was the data were fabricated, but, you know, they might have a more sympathetic conclusion. To, but now forget just the grant money. Yeah, social media affects this because you're right. Like this is a careful and this is why I go to like, uh, you know, sites like Science Daily, red meat consumption associated with increased type 2 diabetes risk. That's accurate, right? Associations mean correlation. They're not causal. They're just suggestive. Whereas you get on social media, and this is going to become why you need to ditch the red meat, right? Uh, it's just going to be that kind of sensationalized. It's not careful, right? Scientists are careful. Science is reductionist. The hypotheses that we try to answer are very narrow. Yeah, and the researcher on the evening news insofar as there even is evening news, right? Because, yeah, now it's all social media, is always full of caveats. Well, only in this population. Well, an association isn't cause and effect. And, they, you know, they're always, it seems like they're backpedaling, but they're actually being accurate, right? Because that's how science works. You said something just a minute ago that I heard an NIH researcher, a powerhouse at a conference once, he said, we get real excited over things that would bore the average public, Right. 
because we are not going to sensationalize it. They're just left saying, well, okay, I guess that's meh, you know. Meanwhile, we're all excited about some finding because it inches us forward. But yeah, when it comes to books in the media, everything's like the new rules, the new revolution. And that doesn't happen every year in science. It, it just doesn't. You know, you don't overturn decades of careful stepwise reporting uh, and observations, uh, statistical analysis with somebody's new opinion. But like you said, that grabs that grabs headlines. So, uh, and I do think scientists, being human beings, are prone to, especially in certain journals, you might be more prone to one thing than another. Like back in the day, I had some data that really high protein diets were not stressful to the kidneys. They didn't weaken bones. They didn't even hurt diet quality. And I would have to be careful where I sent that. There were some journals that were decidedly kind of anti-protein, or at least they'd be much less likely to publish that than if I were to go to uh, other journals, like let's say a sports nutrition journal where people are just more pro-protein. Again, Am I fabricating any of those data? Not at all. Not at all. But there is some politics and some strategy where I might send that because sometimes you get especially journals that are associated with a professional group. You know what used to be the ADA, the, now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics or maybe the, the NSCA. These groups have certain, I don't know, um, parts of their practice that they're going to kind of cling to, you know, a skeptical person could say that's their party line. Why would you try to publish something against the party line? So I do think, I do think that over the years, and maybe this is me old and jaded, but I, politics does influence us. And when I say politics, I don't mean Republican versus Democrat. I just mean, you know, the human, I always call it the primate dominance hierarchy, right? We evolved from primates. So we like to fall in line under a certain leader kind of thing. And I do think those sorts of trends and, uh, party lines, if you will. I do think they influence science. Uh, good researchers are not going to fabricate anything, of course. It's completely unethical. It happens. But yeah, when I look at this stuff, I, it, it feels like that trend. Like it's so popular. Replace all your red meat with plant-based proteins. Well, there's pros and cons. You know, I'd like to see a paper on that, in fact. A, a buddy of mine, Steve Hertzler, he actually did a paper uh, two years ago, I think, uh, specifically about plant proteins. And so that's the pros and cons, and I rather see stuff like that. What are the pros and cons of plant proteins? Uh, or, you know, what's good about red meat? Like, I haven't looked at this article, but I really hope the actual researchers, this goo, GU, and colleagues, I hope there's some indication of, well, if you're going to replace red meat, here's what you're going to miss out on. You know, uh, like I was talking about creatine, carnosine, uh, it, it could be certain B vitamins, whatever it might be. You're going to miss out on some stuff. So I don't know. It's just an interesting topic, I think. And we beat this to death, but this is a brand new study. It's yet another one. So, you know, I'm just trying to report on the news, some of the science news. It's a big leap from red meat to just plant-based proteins. Like you don't even stop at like, you know, short of plant-based. It's like you just say red meat, bad, you know, versus, oh, maybe you should choose some more, you know, white meats, I guess is what they would consider. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. more chicken and fish or whatever. Right. So that's like a huge leap in it in and of itself. So if you set up the question, like even you set up the premise as red meat or plant based, it's like there has to, you know, you have to have some range. And I remember we used to do some of this stuff when we'd really go through papers in college. So it's been a long time, but you know, it'd just be like, you know, what's the method and like how big of the conclusion that is for what the setup of the study was. Like, that's a huge conclusion. You know, that would be like a home run kind of hit if you like really got it. I mean, it would be like someone coming off the out of the stands and hitting a home run versus like a pro pitcher. Basically, it's such a big hit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Like, that's hard to do in science. Like, it's really hard to get a huge home run like that. Right. Totally. I mean, they're suggesting the researchers from the actual journal say substituting one serving a day of dairy for total processed or un unprocessed red meat was also associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes. 
Uh, by the way, this is the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It's really at a top tier, if not the top tier journal. So this is why I took it seriously. Um, this is not the only paper to suggest this connection as well. Now, would I do that? Yeah, I might do something like that. Like you said, it's not some huge home run. But there might be one day a week that, like for me, instead of drive, pulling through Arby's uh, on my way home from work or something like that, you know, have a whey protein shake between the car seats or something. Um, I would work with that. And I think listeners to this podcast, they just need to realize how do I incorporate something like this in my diet if I even want to at all? Because, uh, yeah, you are giving up some nutrients to replace it with others. And and like like you're saying, this is not going to be some magic bullet. And you could even argue that these guys aren't athletes. You know, they're not working their muscles regularly. Like if our listeners are lifting – if they're lifers and they lift their whole lifespan, they're always going to have lower risk. Uh, I'd like to go see what the odds ratio would be for like somebody who, uh, you know, is into weightlifting, uh, bodybuilding, powerlifting, like how much lower? Cause we know of course athletes have way lower. They have better glycemic control, lower diabetes risk and all that kind of stuff. So, but again, these are nurses and there's, you know, health professionals, uh, cohorts, and at least they would be more conscious in their choices, I would think. But then, you know, we've both seen a lot of nurses and, and physicians and even dietitians and stuff that just... Uh, I mean, they, you know what's crazy <laughs> about that part is like, when it, speaking of Washburn, it's like, so there's a nursing program there. And you know who was outside smoking all the time was mm-hmm. the nurses. Like, mm-hmm. the, you know what I mean? So that's that's always kind of a funny one. It's like, you kind of expect that from health, but it's like a Sometimes it's like the hairdresser who never has their hair done. Like they're busy yeah. doing everyone else's hair. They don't take <laughs> right. their own kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, my wife and I were just talking about that with counselors too. Like they have all kinds of great advice and coping skills for their clients and they don't use them themselves. You know, they fall prey to a lot of these things themselves. So, all right. Well, I don't want to uh, bore our listeners or you <laughs> with this stuff because we – it's just brand new. It's back in my face. And I'm like, well, all right, we'll report on it. And I think everybody just needs to make these decisions themselves, keeping in mind what kind of pattern of a diet that you have. I am not going to be super eager to replace uh, my red meats. So, yeah. Okay, let's go to break. When we come back, uh, you can lead us on a discussion on uh, weightlifting technique versus style and, and that kind of stuff. Hey everybody, Iron Radio is back, and in an expanded way. What can you expect? Well, first, you can get it simulcast every week on the NutritionRadio.org network, as well as on the original podcast. It'll appear regularly on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. We have a new Iron Radio slash Nutrition Radio Facebook page as well. Please check us out. We're even backed up on YouTube. Second, Please tell your friends who are longtime loyal listeners that they may see emails that share just the episode link and the show notes. This is a new thing, and we hope it will build community. Third, if you are a supporting member in the past, we may prompt you to resume through PayPal, but we will confirm each and every donor before reinstating that membership category. We'll never just restart your $4 auto payments without agreement from you. And of course, we will accept new members moving forward as well. Starting back slowly and honorably is the goal. And lastly, expect the sister show, Nutrition Radio, to expand it to once-weekly, 45- to 60-minute episodes with guest co-hosts covering the same nerdy nutrition news that's been broadcast for a few months now in daily 10-minute clips. We hope that an expanded presence will get you the news, education, banter, and guests that's made Iron Radio's community so loyal from the start. You are appreciated. Welcome back, everyone. So when you started learning lifting and there was just this plethora of advice out there or you had a, you know, differing coaches, if some of you, if you are just bouncing around from coach to coach and you always get like the, the newest quote unquote great advice and in the sport of weightlifting specifically, but I think this probably happens in powerlifting too, just based on what I've seen and kind of been a part of is the difference between style and technique. And what I want to kind of draw a distinction on is technique is the principles of the lift that make it 
go essentially like that are the the critical principles to lifting you know your best like applying your strength to the lift to the barbell in the best means possible whereas style is more of i mean kind of individualistic choices sometimes they are completely like team choices but like nine times out of ten when people are talking about i shouldn't say nine times out of ten a lot of times when people are talking about bad technique it's really just a style they don't like like it's it's a, a separate style not wrong not right and just to give people a clearer example of this is the chinese weightlifting system their chinese weightlifting i'm just going to call it style versus like the russian or eastern european style and a simple thing is so the chinese tend to slide their feet when they move to get under the bar whereas the eastern european and russians they tend to like they like a big jump stomp like like a big violent jump and stomp world records have been broken both ways championships like championships have been won both ways and the critical part of like what those teams do well is i mean not only train consistently and probably use a lot of drugs but in weightlifting it's did the bar stay close were you patient in getting the barbell to your hips and do you have a solid bottom receiving position and stable you know stable positions you know throughout your lift but nine so much so often when we get on and especially in weightlifting and people use this to like steal clients and steal athletes or whatever. They're like, Oh, you're lifting, you're lifting terrible. This is a terrible technique. You'd be so much better. Da, 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 da. But there is a truth, like a baseline truth to technique. Like, and a lot of people can get closer to that. Style is so subjective and varied. So I'm curious especially for you, Lonnie, when you learn lifting, like what were the critical components to the lifts that you were learning? Like the core critical components, let's say of like a squat, we'll use the squat. We've talked about that before. Yeah. Well, I think early on, I mean, it's important to understand that the way a lot of people get into bodybuilding is they self-teach this stuff, right? It's not like I had a weightlifting coach. I mean, what I learned, I learned from magazines, to be honest with you, like, butt below so yeah, that, parallel. That's perfect. You know, that's perfect. Um, yeah, wider stance, butt below parallel. I would do what I guess most people would call a power squat. The bar's a little lower on my traps because I can handle more weight that way than a high bar, you know, quote unquote Olympic squat is what I was told. But yeah. Right. So, and, and in this case, I mean, so uh, there is an aspect of this in power thing where, Maybe it's the it's the IPF is the kind of major European one, right? With the, they go they US USAPL feeds into IPF. Am I correct? That's right. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. So you have a lot of countries, and it's it's different all around. Like so you have a lot of countries who squat like weightlifters, right? They learn to squat like weightlifters, high bar, deep. And a lot of them just stick with it and they stay with it and hit big numbers like a weightlifter with a little bit higher bar. Then you had the French who got in trouble at this last world championships for like they would get the bar so far down on their back. It just looks so sketchy, but this ultra low bar looks super uncomfortable. But I mean, they got in trouble for like doing that. But what determines what is better or worse about those two things? In your opinion, I guess. Yeah. I felt like I could, because I could use more weight and I would just get rocked, you know, like my adductors, a lot of like uh, inner thigh, it wasn't all focused like down around my kneecaps. It wasn't like, you know, look, the teardrop and, and quad dominant stuff. I felt like I just got bigger legs. I did grow. I mean, there was a time, I, I don't know how big this is by any kind of pro standards, but I had 28 inch thighs and my waist was only 29. <laughs> so I, I got really big legs doing that kind of squat. So I just kept doing it, you know, uh, and I became sort of habitual, I guess. Um, 
if I wanted to do – this is kind of funny now that we're talking about it because instead of changing my squat style, I would have added stuff like leg extensions or some accessory movement if I felt like I needed to get more lower quad development or something like that. You know, And looking back at the way my legs were, yeah, I had sort of a oval-shaped thighs. I was not real heavy, giant – uh, quads hanging over my kneecap kind of thing. I was never like that. But I would have chosen accessory movements rather than change my style because I just got so habituated into into my, you know, my wider stance, low bar squats. So, right. yeah, just habit, right. I guess. And that's perfect. So, and like you, so you squat over a little bit lower bar and that worked out for you well, right? And then you use assistance work to cover up the other weaknesses, essentially. So, could you perceptively imagine going back to starting and, you know, going back in time. And then we tell you, to, like, you somehow switch to just high bar. How different do you think your experience with lifting would be if you did, you know, a similar style of training, but you just switch the high bar for the low bar? How different do you think your leg development and all that would have truly been? Well, that's a good question. That's a really – I just have no basis for that. You know, uh, I would guess that maybe I would have ended up with a little bit more lower quad development around my knees, but I don't know that. Let's say you did that. You had lower quad – a little bit more lower quad development, and then you your assistance work would have just changed to cover the other weaknesses, yeah? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, with the same philosophy of training. So neither neither aspect, neither squat was truly that important. As long as your feet were flat on the ground, you know, you squatted to depth and you stood up. I mean, those were like the, and, you know, kept your, kept decent posture of the lift and you were consistent in training. Like these are like the principles of like what actually, you know, helped you develop more so than what style of squat you actually used. And this is kind of the, that's a that's a big point comparative to just in terms of like how you lift. So like in the squat itself, it's like is the bar high on your traps? Is it low on your traps? Like it's not going to matter all that much as long as you are, you know, sticking to the principles of the squat. So for pretty much everyone, that's hip getting below parallel for well for most people, mm-hmm. barring an injury, your feet stay flat on the ground in a squat. Like a technique thing would be like our goal is to get the the bar in as straight a line as possible, right? So it's not like we're mm-hmm. trying to – we don't want to see that much deviation of movement. So we're trying to mm-hmm. adjust our movement to get the straightest line possible. That's technique. Where you put the bar, you know, whether you do a slight break at the knees first or whatever – like these things are like inconsequential to like the success of the lift overall. But people speak about these things like they are the, you know, most critical components of lifting. They say, oh, and there's camps of, on both sides where they'll say, all right, so you have the low bar and the high bar people. So this does exist with like the, you know, starting strength and rip people versus like people who do weightlifting, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, if you just put your, Put that bar lower, look at the ground, and drive with your hips. That's the way to squat. And then the way that there's like, that's weird because you should put the bar on the top of your traps and you should sit straight down all the way onto your, you know, tell your hamstrings, just cover your calves, mm-hmm. and then stand up. Sometimes, they, I think they both kind of teach catching the bounce to some degree, like some sort of reflex action in the bottom of the lift. Right, yep. But the truth is, people have gotten strong both ways. Like, the the actual thing that mattered there, and I have my arguments against, like, some of the, like, starting strength style, like squatting, but that's more based on, like, technique. Like, what do you want to see out of the technique of the bar? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you want to see out of the technique of the lift? Like, do you really want to see a good morning? You know, like, because if you drive with the hips, a lot of people, that's where they... That's what happens. But yeah, can you does it truly matter? Can you re can you revisit like with this with a choice between high versus low if you could get a really neutral coach, you know, who wasn't wound up in his or her own style. 
would you prescribe one versus the other based on like limb length and torso length and all that kind of stuff? Like tailor it to the client, you know what I'm saying? Uh, generally, and, and so in this case, let's say somebody has a background of they've learned to lift somewhere else and they come to me. The things that are important to me are not where the bar is on your back. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you squat with whatever style you have for a while, like until I see a glaring error that I need to be changed. Mm-hmm. And people sometimes get frustrated with me in this in this aspect. Same with um, you know weightlifters. It's like you don't give a hundred thousand coaching cues. It's like yeah, because that stuff is inconsequential to the lifting success. So if you're squatting low, like I've had lifters who come in and like, all right, I want to do weightlifting with you now, but I've been low bar squatting. And I'm like, okay, just low bar squat. Like I don't care. Like I'm not gonna. Mm-hmm. You're as long as you're getting stronger, you're going to be successful. Now, I might have them do switch to high bar based on how often we squat. Like, we squat really often. So doing that low bar puts a lot of tension on the shoulders and gives, like, some extra shoulder pain that I don't need for most people. So that's different. I don't have anything against, like, the low bar squat. So that's a different thing. And it's the same with, like, the way Phil has coached me on various things is, like, the things that are important to the lift, you can learn in like 10 minutes and then it'll take you 10 years to figure it out, but like of practicing it to like actually learn it. But the things that are not important are like the things most coaches say all the time, but they act like it's the most important thing in your entire life. I see. Yep. And so it's like, I don't have a preference. So if you came to me, Lonnie, and you're all of a sudden like, I want to, you know, train your style. And I said, what? And I'd say, okay. And we have some follow-up questions. How have you been squatting? So I've been squatting low bar. It's become more comfortable for me. I feel like you get a little bit more depth. Like, okay, cool. I mean, your legs are 28 inches, so it must be working fine. So we're not going to change that aspect of it. The strategy of the whole of the training as a whole might change for you. It might be a lot different. And then new problems might arise. But like the style of squatting that you choose or the style of lifting that you do generally has to do with your own, not only personal style, but like your your comfort with the lift. Like if you were more comfortable with the low bar and you're like, it's like, okay, I can get you to squat that way more often because you're like, that feels better for me versus I'm forcing myself into all these uncomfortable positions or you know, for what re- for what reason besides that the coach just likes it that way? How much of that do you think – is it just marketing then? Like you come to my gym, here's how we do it, you know, because I'm the shit and people should follow my style, you know. Or is that disrespecting the client because it sounds like you have much more of a, a hands-off when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I would just say in the United States, especially with weightlifting, because it's, it is so incestual, right? So it's – it's more of just a marketing thing. And they'll say, oh, my gosh, you're lifting dangerously. And I'll use at least an example. So I had a kid lifting a while back, right? And he just started lifting. We did a competition. We go to the competition, and another coach approaches the lifter and says, oh, my gosh, you're lifting dangerously, right? Mm-hmm. And I know this coach. This coach has a significant amount of goofy injuries in his training style, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think he's necessarily wrong with the way he trains. It's just like his style of training, right? But they use that to say, oh, you're lifting incorrectly. Well, the next time we came to a meeting, that kid had been training with me more, you know, consistently. And then had qualified for nationals and stuff. I think we qualified for nationals at this meet. You know, same coaches or similar coaches are coming up and saying, oh, my gosh, you have great technique. It's like nothing really changed besides that they were lifting more often. (laughs) Yeah. Like, and, and this concept, I, I mean, I try to use it to like explain it to like most, you know, lifters coming in is like, I want you to be comfortable with the movements that you select and like not critically like analyzing is the bar 15 degrees, you know, is your knees 15 degrees, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, get the protractor out. Let's make sure <laughs> yeah, whatever right. it is. Yeah. Versus, I want you to attack the lifts and you really can't do that. If you're thinking about every tiny aspect 
Like in weightlifting, it's not that important. Like I tell my lifters when they go to a meet, there are two things that you need to know when you get on the platform. And it's lockout and down command. I want you at your like base animal instincts to go after lifts. If you come to me and I say, what's a good cue I've heard? Like long toes. I've heard that one before. And I say long toes, <laughs> whatever. Okay. And I'm like, I need you to, you know, extend or, or something like that. Like these things don't really mean necessarily anything besides like, you know, specific to the lifter. It can mean something because it might trigger a response or whatever. But a lot of times it it's just like the style of what the coach wants to see. The coach will see other lifters lift a certain way who are having success and be like, oh, well, imagine how strong they could be. And it's like that takes away from the aspect of lifting and training in general. Yeah, it does. You know, Jarrell, your approach reminds me, there's an old Ben Franklin quote, energy and persistence conquer all things, right? The older I get, the more I think just punching the clock and getting in your total dose of iron every week, very few other things are going to have that much impact, right? If you get in the the certain dose, that prescribed dose of iron, and you do it week after week after week, uh, and then nutrition is there. Obviously, you got to grow. you got to have fuel and building blocks. But that is so much bigger than almost anything else. Now, I know what you're talking about is performance and not just, you know, gains. But I can totally see what you're saying about, like, People will overemphasize something. It might be just because, like, for marketing purposes or for whatever. Uh, but success should should speak for itself. If somebody is progressing with the end goal they want, their squat number is just going up, up, up. You know, every time they go to a meet, why would you tell them, "No, no, you're doing it all wrong. You need to do it my way." You know, and it's funny too because the squat is a bodybuilding movement in my mind. I mean, obviously, it's powerlifting and it's it's everything, but. When I learned like stuff like clean and jerk, and I'm not good at this stuff, and you, you guys would laugh at me if, I, if you watched me do this stuff, but I had a coach, and he was specifically saying, you got to leave the ground. You got to stomp, you know, explosion, explosion kind of stuff, and it, I didn't even realize that the Chinese were more you know, sliding in the way they approached that kind of stuff, but that was never one of my – end goals you know to increase my numbers in in some of those lifts i had other other things going on but um it is funny that when there was instruction involved i got that style cue you know and when i learned stuff on my own i kind of ended up settling into my own style which might be wise so just a thought yeah i, I mean i think that's kind of the that's generally the gist is kind of what i want to at least get across is like the the style of lifting that you are doing is insignificant to the on a particular lift it's insignificant to the basic principles and mechanics so for weightlifting it's keeping the bar close for you know squat and bench we're trying to keep as straight a line as possible squat bench and deadlift to some degree uh, trying to keep as straight a line as possible in the movement and then you know, so you can apply force in the most efficient way possible. Everything else is like, it's just noise. And then if you're thinking about all these things as you go to live, like you have 80,000 things that you need to like figure out as you're in the middle of a one second lift, it's silliness. It is just complete nonsense. Yeah, I've heard Phil say that before too. And I think some people are more prone to that than others. I would be. I would overthink everything little thing and end up doing way worse in the meat than I did just in the gym, right? Because I'm like, got to think about this, you know, back straight, you know, fire this joint first and then that joint. And I would be like mind scrambled. It would suck as opposed to just go do it, you know, lean into your training. When you're under duress, you revert to your training, the motor skills that you've burned in, you know? So I think that's actually good advice, really good advice. Okay, we're about out of time, so I'm glad we got into discussion despite Phil being sick and, you know, Mike being unavailable. So, uh, good stuff. I guess, everybody, we'll be back next week. Um, did you have any closing thoughts, Jarrell? Uh, I do not. Okay. All right, we'll see you guys uh, next week, and uh, that's it for now.
Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.